Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 227 for Monday, September 23rd, 2019. Greetings, folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about us weekend warriors, us working musicians. Here, as usual, in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Los Gatos, California, it's Paul Kent. Hey, man, how goes? It goes good, man. I had such an interesting weekend. I can't wait to tell you about it. I had a couple of, uh, I had two real interesting gigs, uh, two festival gigs. Ah, okay. All right. And, um, you know, festivals are tough for us. A 10 piece band, you know, with the amount of time for a changeover, usually it's 30 minutes, 30 minutes to get the other band off to get our band on and mic'd and anything close to a sound check to get us started close to time. It's almost impossible. 30 minutes is, I don't know if we've ever done 30, 35, that's tight. maybe, yeah, usually that's, 45. That's tight for any band, I would think. Now, is that include setting up your gear or yeah. no? Yeah, oh, we, yeah. You don't get the stage, you know, until right. the, other sta- the band is off. So the band is, you know, five, eight minutes to get off if they're hustling. Yeah. If they're not hustling, it gets tense because, you know, again, we have a bill, which is awesome. So, Bill will actually jump on and help the other band get off stage. Well, that's the trick, right? Is, is offering, like, I will always, I will get my, if in a scenario like that, I will get my drums as staged as possible, right? Like assembled as far as they can go. Our guys do without moving. Right. And then I will go up on stage. I, I make it a rule not to bring any of our band's gear on stage until a hundred percent of that band's gear is off stage. It's That's just, just good manners. It's just, it, just well, good courtesy. It's good courtesy, but it also makes it really easy to make sure that, you know, nobody's stuff is getting intermingled or anything like that because mm. they're cables and all that stuff. It's like, okay, are you done with the stage? Let's dummy check it. Yep. Okay. Thanks. See ya. And then off you go. So the first thing I do is I go up on stage. I congratulate the drummer on their great set. And yep. I ask what I can do to help with, you know, I'm a drummer too. I, I know how this stuff works. You know, what pieces does your set break down into easily that we can do? And I do that a, to be helpful and to move things along, but B to send the message that you're not taking your symbols off their stands while your stands are still on stage. <laughs> because some cats will do that. They'll be like, Oh yeah. yeah, I just need to like, it's like, no, what, what are you thinking, dude? You do that over there. Like oh, the same spot where I put my symbols on their stands, you know, like this is how this is going to work. And some guys totally get that. Like it's not, it, but every now and then you run into somebody that's like, Oh, sure. I will take the slow road here. It's like, no, you won't. I'm not going to let that happen. We're just, I'm showing you the pace that we are all moving at and I will help you with, with that pacing. And if they want to help minutes. me bring my stuff up afterwards, that's great. But I certainly don't expect it. So, and, but 30 minutes, even for a four piece, five piece band, it's pushing it. Right. I mean, cause it's not 30 minutes, it's 20 minutes, right? It's 20. Right. It, and that's tight. I mean, I've, I've done it. Look, you, you know, if you're sharing a back line, it can really work. Like, it, you know, I go to South by Southwest a lot. And th- those sets are 40 minutes on, 20 minutes off, 40 minutes on, 20 minutes off all night long. And right. if they're sharing a back line, that is no problem. Uh, right. it, if they aren't sharing a back line, it works, but it takes, uh, you know, like there are people there to facilitate that that are separate from the band members, uh, you know, that, that are like South by crew that take care of that thing. But, yeah, sure. it can it can work. But mm. we do everything to make this easier. And I got to say, after 20 years, it's never easier. We send stage plots in advance. Some oh, festivals yeah. are savvy enough to ask. The sound guys are savvy enough to ask. Some are not still, which is amazing to me. Again, we have a bill who, you know, reaches out to the sound company, tries to get them ready. And also, you know, we are, what was I telling you? We have five wireless mics on our horns. Now six, actually. One guy has two horns, um, two wireless guitars, 
um, we've, uh, we've got some, we've got a lot of stuff. So, yeah. and wireless is often, that's hard to do sometimes, you know, if there's a problem, it's hard to chase down a problem, a wireless problem in the, that amount of time. Yeah. You kind of need to have it. Well, the good news is you can test some of that stuff off stage. If, mm-hmm. if, you know, if, if the scenario sort of allows well, for you don't it. Want to bonk the, the band that's on stage. That's right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. So anyway, the story is we, um, the festival we did on Saturday, was a new one for us. It's a very well-known festival in the area, very well attended, good bands, you know, really good lineups. And um, I've been pitching them for years and years and years. And I finally got us in. Uh, the two gentlemen who who manage the festival, good, good guys. I mean, and they're just getting banged on by 10,000 bands. But they're actually quite polite and quite responsive and quite informative about, you know, how to apply and, you know, feedback on your band, that type of thing, which is kind of cool. Uh, we got a, a, a spot that was the right before the headliner for the day. So we played on Saturday, the four to six slot was the headliner or four 30 to six 30 slot. We played two. Th- it must've been five to seven. Cause we played two 30 to four 30. Um, not a bad slot. Um, we got there. There was a, a similar band before us. Okay. Um, it had a three horns. Um, I, I did not think to check with them. I didn't, and I should have. So that's my bad. To but with the oh, sure. with the headlining band who I knew, I sent a note and said, um, and said, "Hey, let's let's compare set lists. Let's make sure there's no crossover." We did that. It was all great. And but I didn't do it with the band before us. I didn't assume that the band before us would be a horn band, and um, and uh, there was one or two crossovers. But they, you know, they were this. The crowd changed over, so I ended up not pitching it. Plus, I had the unique issue for this gig that I had a sub drummer. Um, and so I started talking about this in last week's episode, the sub drummer thing. Um, you know, it was, it's stressful. Yeah. We spent a lot of time trying to get him up to a certain level. We didn't know what we were going to get. And, you know, it was a, a festival I really wanted to uh, do well at. Also, it was pretty far away. And a couple of our guys were, were almost, well, let's call them late. And they were late because of traffic. I mean, it was just like several sure. pockets of traffic. Yeah. That, anyway, so well, a little that bit of happens. Stress. Yeah. A little bit of stress. I didn't, I, I decided not to mess with the set list to keep the sub drummer, you know, focused and not, you know, thinking that there were variables going to happen all the time. Oh, so we just right. kind of, uh, you couldn't, yeah, you couldn't audible those tunes out without sort of messing with that guy's, that guy's head. Yeah. 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 Huh. Interesting. Yeah. So back to the sub drummer in a little bit, but just net net the, the Saturday gig was cool. We did, we played well, you know, sound on stage was not good. You know, that's the, that's what you really give up. Right. Those tented small stages get, they just get loud. I mean, they just are hard. And so that kind of like relax, you know, you know what it's like when it's too loud on a stage, you're fighting through it all the time. You never really relax. You I, can't really sit. I and, do and know just, what it's like, but I also know that there is a way to solve that problem. <laughs> like I'll, I'll bring up in ears again, but if you get your whole band on in ears, man, that problem is no longer an issue. A hundred percent of the time. Yeah. So not going to happen, but, <laughs> but, uh, but what happens is, is, you know, you're taking a guess with, you know, just a couple strums of chords or yeah. a couple of hits on the keyboard. You're taking a guess. You don't get a, you don't get a song sound check. You just, you get line checked and then you go. And then that's and it. Again, and you don't even get a break. Like, it's not like it's a, you know, a three set gig where you have to start out of the gate. Like, okay, well, you know what? We will, we'll get through this set, but then You know, it's a three set gig. So the first set is sort of laid back and you can take a little bit of time in between songs or whatever. Like these one set festival style gigs, you got to be going full tilt from start to finish. And there is no opportunity to say, "Okay, hey, whoa, can we pump the brakes for 30 seconds? The answer is no, you cannot. I mean, you could. And if it was utter disaster, you would. But you would. You really want to avoid that because it's just. It, it it ruins the flow of exactly what you're out there trying to do. And, and you have limited time on stage. So, and the yeah. first three songs essentially are figuring out what the heck is going to happen. Right. They, yes. You know, we have, we have bill with an iPad kind of walking around in front of the stage on the sides of the stage, checking in with people, asking them what they need. Yeah. You're trying to play while you're trying to communicate your, your, your mix needs. I go real simple. I only take my voice. It's a small stage. I only take my voice in the monitor. You know, I can hear everything else. The problem yeah. is I don't have a mix of everything else. Right. And, um, you know, there, it's a little bit of a, you survive it. That's sort of, that's an interesting thing to, to dig into here because there, um, 
it, it's what there, there's a difference between what would you want in an absolute perfect world in terms of your monitor mix. But then there's what do you actually need? And and I would posit that most musicians, um, unless you stop and think about that, you probably haven't you probably don't know the answer to what do you like? What's the bare bones that you need? And like you, you're a guitar player. You don't want any of your guitar in the monitor. Like, I, and that makes sense to me, but it would, I, I would not have been surprised if you said, and I need some of my guitar, right? So, but you know, all I, like if, if we're in a, you know, survival scenario, just give me vocals down here. I'll deal with the rest. You, you know, I can hear I, that's the thing that I need to be above everything else. I'll deal with, you know, if I can't hear my guitar perfectly, no problem. Uh, I'm good, but vocals, that's the one thing that's not being put on stage. So give me that. And maybe you don't even need other people's vocals or maybe you do, right? You might need a chief harmony singer or something if, if you want that, but you know, knowing, figuring that out for yourself and coming into a gig, being able to say, you know, in five seconds, give me this and let's go. That's a valuable piece of knowledge to to have when you're walking into a scenario like that. Well, I would say it's a, it's more a social construct because I know guys who they insist they insist on having exactly what they need to yeah. perform. They need their vocals where they need it and, and rung out and, and EQ'd, and they need their instrument. You know, they need to be able to hear it, and literally they cannot start the gig if they're not comfortable. I'm more of an empath. And when I realize it's loud on stage, I don't want to add to that by throwing more stuff into my monitor. Right. So I will usually sacrifice a little bit of what I would really like to not add to the problem overall. That's that's probably not the smartest thing in the world, but it's my solution, right? The trick would be if everybody in the band was of the same mindset, like, okay, that's it. We are in sacrifice mode. Like everybody's going to sacrifice here. Take the one thing that you really need and let's go. Yeah, but you know, guys that are like, listen, that's that's a failed philosophy because I'm telling you what I need. <laughs> you know, what I need is what I need. And yeah, if it if it you know, takes more time or you, do you want me to perform well or not? I know guys that have that mindset. And I don't think yeah. you can sell. You can't sell to someone who has that mindset. Don't be that way. I, I don't know. Maybe you. I think you can. I, I think I, I mean, I've had that conversation with bands before. I mean, it's been a long time. Fling is is we know what we need and we can we can make it happen very, very quickly. But we're all we're all very aware that sometimes you can't you, you know you can't always get what you want. Right. Mm-hmm. And and you yet you still have to deliver. Like, let's take the person that that says, nope, I need my, you know, 10 minutes of tweaking and EQing and perfectly setting. If their monitor dies in the middle of the gig, that person most likely is a professional and they are just going to go and deal. I've heard great bands play without monitors and sing and sound great. They yep. know how to focus on their part. They know how to hear it in their, in their head, feel the vibration in their head and get it done. So I, I mean, think, so I think it's worth, I mean, certainly in the moment having that conversation is the wrong time. Right. But it's like, right. look, Hey, look guys, you know, we've got five festival gigs coming up this summer. We all know how it is. The next time we're at a house rockers gig where we get our own time and we get to put our own sound together and we, we all get exactly what we want. Can everybody just stop and think, what do you, what's the bare minimum that you need? And then please write that down so we can just give bill a list that he can have for bare minimums so we can really get moving and couch it in the efficiency scenario. But you know, uh, that might, I don't know, something like that would be how I would go about having that conversation. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, Interesting. Yeah, right. I mean, because you you kind of well, have- I'm, I'm, more, I'm just more struck that in the moment is definitely not the time. to do De- it. Definitely I mean, not the time. adds to frustration and adds, to, adds totally. to consternation. So totally. But it it's if you haven't had but you're going to have frustration in that moment anyway, if you've got, you know, five piece band where there's two guys that are, you know, being nitpicky about every little thing. And then three guys that are like, look, guys, we're in survival mode. So I've just I, I've sacrificed. Right. So there's going to be frustration on either side of that coin. Why not separate from the environment and have that conversation, you know, at a time when everybody can just like talk and say and, and maybe even make a collaborative thing so that the guy who's saying, hey, I need all this stuff. Maybe somebody who has sort of been through it and figured out for themselves how to deal can offer some 
constructive advice. Like, hey, what if you just did this? And, uh, you know, if everybody. So here, here's what I'll share back with you. Everything yeah. you're saying makes total sense. Yep. Everything like that goes right out the window in the moment, though. I mean, mm-hmm. it, just, it seems to be this the way it is over and over and over yeah. again. You talk, you talk through things. You have tacit agreements. Let's watch volume one variable changes and plans, you know, immediately go out the window. Out the window. But, you know, it, yeah. It, and I, there's a there's a level of maybe it's a level of that's one of those things that separates a pro from a from a semi pro. You know, maybe is yeah. really that discipline. Yep. You know, may, maybe it's just human nature. Again, you know, it's, it's one of those low hanging tents where the sound bounces around up there. You know, guys don't want to struggle too bad. They want to make sure they hear themselves and nobody's doing it to be facetious. Nobody's like, screw everybody. I'm going to I'm going to make my I'm going to be louder. I'll be fine. I'll get mine at the risk of everybody else. But again, you know, drums ring loudly in these semi enclosed areas and and uh, you got to hear something. And then all of a sudden, everybody's got to hear something. And all of a sudden it's away from you. When I was when I did that music hall, in ears would solve it. In ears would. That's right. But but like sometimes that's not an option. Like that music hall gig that I did with the the TEDx thing that I was talking about last week, uh, we weren't on in ears. We were all playing one song. You know, it wouldn't have made sense to to dial in all those mixes. I get there and we had all of about we played half of the song as a sound check that morning, and then they were like, "All right, you're good. Moving on." And I could hear almost nothing where I was. And it was like, mm. oh, holy crap. I got to lock in with that drummer. So I just moved my congas like one little bit so that I could see past the bass player to the drummer. And was like, all right, I'm watching his hands and his feet. I, we're good. And if I can hear some guitar that's going to bleed in from somewhere, great. And if I can't, well, it, I'll deal. And and you just have to deal. Like, it's just mm. like, okay, you know, fine. Figure out what you can do. I My, uh, my friend Michael Parrish, actually, who I'd love to have on the show someday, said he did that he's a keyboard player fantastic keyboard player he loved to tell the story of this gig that he did with uh aaron comas who's the uh, drummer from the spin doctors right uh, great groove guy and he's playing this gig with him and he you know i think he had hired aaron for the gig it was michael's gig and he knew there were no monitors on stage and he's playing and he's watching or f- noticing that aaron's locking in with every thing that he does and he's like how can he hear me way over there over drums? And then he looks and he realizes he can't like Aaron's eyes are laser focused on Michael's left hand. And that's all he's doing all night long. It's like, okay, well, this is the gig. Like I, I, there's no monitor. Uh, whatever I can hear isn't enough. And so I, you figure out another way to do it and you stare at that. And I've, I've kept that, that lesson in mind, like, oh, yeah, there there are other ways to solve this it's problem. A He's a pro. Well, yeah, the dude's a pro. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Makes interesting. Sense. Yeah. All right, hey, well, I got a few more stories to tell, but I want to hear about some of these reader mails that we've gotten lately. It yeah. Like we got uh, an email from Dan that I wanted to kind of address, uh, A, because it's a fun little email, but also just to maybe dispel any misconceptions here. So I mentioned last week. That we are now producing the show in stereo and uh, all the comments that we've gotten about that have been fantastic. So we will keep doing that unless there's a problem. But Dan writes, he says, uh, the show sounds great in stereo. Really great. He says, does that mean you're liking the roadcaster interface? He says, I've been looking at it myself. He says, "Um, can it put out a mix minus over USB to use as the audio source that Paul hears? So your voice comes in on a physical mic. You're playing audio samples from the mixer and then getting Paul's line in over USB. And what does Paul get? Okay, so I will explain as briefly as I can our podcasting setup. But the first thing I want to say is we are not using that Rodecaster Pro mixer. Um, it, It will do on paper. It's awesome. It has all of the things that a podcaster would need. Um, and it's, it has all of the routing that a podcaster would need. It takes this Frankenstein setup that I sort of created with a lot of outboard gear here and puts it all into one box that connects with a USB cable and you're done. Unfortunately, right now, the way they have their compressors and noise gates tuned in that thing, it makes stuff sound no bueno. Um, it's, it's just like it, it, even, even you folks noticed it, right? Like I heard some, like we got some emails and it was like, what's the matter with Dave's sound? And it was because Paul's is coming in through, we, we use a, an app called discord, but it, we, it could be Skype or anything. It doesn't really matter. And 
Paul's audio comes in that way. So the processing of Paul's audio is, is actually happening there more than it is in the, in the mixer. And, and so Paul, you basically sounded the same, but mine, you know, my mic is plugged directly mm-hmm. into whatever mixer we're using. So whatever it's compression and gating has was, is, is very much an impact to how you hear me. And there was a lot of like this kind of thing happening with the other mixer and stuff. And I'm pretty good at not moving around too much in front of the mic. So Anyway, we have moved back to the Behringer UFX. What is it? The 1204? Yeah, UFX 1204. Uh, and then I can use my outboard compression and, and actually get everything dialed in just the way I want. But yeah, we. so I plug into the mixer with a microphone. The mixer is a USB or Firewire mixer, and it has the ability for me to send audio from the computer out to a channel on the mixer. So Paul, you're going into another fader on this mixer. Mm -hmm. And then I use the monitor mix to send a signal back to you. So I have our audio files going to one channel and then each of our mics going to another channel. I send you everything except your mic so that Mm -hmm. you're not hearing yourself on a delay, which yep makes and it, and it works great. This is so much easier to explain to a crowd of musicians than it is to like a crowd of techie uh, people that understand computers, but have never seen a mixer before because I, I like we're done the whole mix minus concept of saying, yeah, I'm just turning Paul off in his own monitor mix. Not exactly the, the opposite of what we would want to do on stage. Mm-hmm. But for this, th- it, that way you're not getting an echo of your sound and it all works. So yeah. Yeah. That's good. There's it, the answer. Th- there's the answer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. On Facebook, Chip uh, had some comments about last week's episode. Uh, We were talking about having a non-musician be your opening act. And one of the things we uh, threw out, one of the ideas we threw out was having a comedian. And Chip Chip says, if you have a comedian open for you, be mindful of how much time you expect them to fill. If you stick someone out there expecting a half hour or more, you could be asking for trouble unless it is someone who really has their act together. He says, I made the comedian mistake once many years ago. The guy showed up and said, OK, what do you want me to do? Like 10 minutes? And Chip was looking for uh, mm-hmm. more like half an hour, like you would out of, say, that's an a old, long set for a comedian. That's a real. Yeah. Think about that for a comedian. It's that's too long. Yeah. I would say, you know, five to ten minutes max would be what you would want out of a comedian and maybe have them do several different sets at set breaks and things like that if you're going to do that. So Chip said on on uh, on that particular gig, both he and the comedian uh, stretched that evening. He also asked, I was talking about this gig that I did with Amanda uh, and I happened to mention that it it was an acoustic gig and it got really loud on stage. And he said, how did an acoustic gig get so loud as to have your ears ringing? And so there are two answers to two bit, two parts to this answer. Um, The first is that it really doesn't take that much exposure to, you know, what I'll call relatively loud music for your ears to start ringing. I'm really sensitive to it because I avoid it at all costs. Um, Mm -hmm. So my guess is I I think most acoustic gigs are probably, especially when you got multiple instruments on stage, most most acoustic gigs tend to get pretty loud. If you've got monitors, they're probably getting louder than, than you think. Uh, So just be mindful of that. Uh, Sure. Yeah. You know, because it, it, it's really easy to get it too loud. Yeah. So I play solo acoustic. I play in a small combo. I play in a uh, harmony trio. Mm. And um, uh, for the harmony trio, you know, we only have one of those Bose uh, personal audio systems, right? It has gotten oddly loud and it is actually, you know, once, once you start doing uh, songs that you're kind of aggressively strumming your guitar, that, that is a loud percussive, you know, many string definition sound coming out of that sound system. And it does, it can get loud if you don't watch it. So I find that when you play aggressive music acoustically, you do have to be pretty conscious of it. You do. So. Yeah. If it's that rock and acoustic sort of vibe. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and then, you know, that particular club, it's, um, it's, it's just a loud room. There's a lot of people in there. There's a lot of conversation that happens. There's re- there's a lot of reflective surfaces. There's glass behind the band uh, with a, a mirror or a window. 
sure. the floors are a wood and and uh, the walls are stone or brick. So it, it really and I had even brought a, a rug to that gig to help, you know, kind of at least diffuse some of that. And I think it did help. We had a better mix. It just wound up being really loud on stage, yeah. which you just need to be mindful of, I think, is is what it is, because like you said, those rock and acoustic gigs can get pretty rock and pretty easily. So and you don't think that they will, but they definitely do. They definitely and I think do. just like everything, the vocals have to be on top of everything. It just that has to happen. So, and, but actually more likely the instrumentation needs to be under the vocals. That's true. There's a, there's a subtle distinction to that. There is for those rock and acoustic gigs. I find that in order to be comfortable singing, I need to hear enough of me certainly, but I also need to hear enough of the sort of low end of the guitar in order to to hear like the fundamental note and blend that. So so there is a for me anyway, there's a there's a balance there. But yeah, you just got to be careful with with volume. And so. again, it depends on the room and it depends on the vibe that's going on, but also once you get up high like that, it's um it's hard to play the delicate stuff. I mean, yes. you know, you haven't left yourself enough room to come down, right? That's interesting. You know, all yeah. expectations are kind of up 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 and then the kind of like more intricate, you know, finger picking stuff you know, it's weird. It's weird in a small coffee shop. Once you've played, take it easy. And it's loud, too loud to try and play landslide. Yeah. Landslide loud is not the same song. Landslide now has a different dynamic to it. And it just, it feels weird. Well, so, and sometimes landslide is the wrong song to play at, an, at a rock and acoustic gig. If, especially if the crowd is loud, that can be, you got to, I mean, you just need to read the room and feel yeah. like, is, is, is this the right time to try and bring these no, I people totally agree. down My with point me? Or is that, that once you've gone there in, in rock and acoustic, it's, it's uh, you've set kind of a, a floor that may not be conducive to more moody vibe songs. I agree with that. Yeah, for yeah. sure. For sure. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. You just got to figure it out. So. All right. So. Anyway, back to my interesting weekend of festivals. There's a couple of observations from this. So the Saturday festival was at a town where we're not really well known. We had a couple of people come from some close towns. Uh, nice to see some friends to support us. But it was mostly kind of a new crowd, which is kind of fun for us. Um, again, far enough away where traffic, you know, created some consternation getting guys there on time. Sub drummer. Uh, you know, a desire. My band, you know, always wants to be the headliner. And so, uh, you know, Having that second, we had, feel we have something to prove. So we got a little bit of an edge, a little bit of, which is, I like. And, um, and again, new people to win over. So we played and we kind of fought through the sound, settled in about three songs in. And we had a very, very good set. The sub drummer did okay. He, let's see, that's the best way to talk about this. He, he prepared. He spent a lot of time. Our drummer spent time with him, several phone conversations, sent him some horn charts so he could see exactly how some of the syncopated he reads. So some of the syncopated endings happen. Yep. Um, Did you get a, a full comment. rehearsal with him? No rehearsal. OK, so that that's tough with your band. Uh, well, evident, well, let me let, let me get through this. here. OK, so so um, he had made a comment when I sent him uh, an audio recording of a show of ours. He goes, he was like, man, you guys really push the tempos. I said, yeah, you know, we tend, we tend to push. Um, sometimes it's right, but sometimes, you know, it's just the adrenaline going. And again, he's a very experienced drummer. So I think one of the things that happened is I think he was determined to try and help us not push tempos. Fair. And, yeah. And, and um, there was a, a fair amount of, you know, when he would set a tempo for a song, um, uh, it would be slower than what we'd like when we would, when I would count off a song, it would end up back where he thinks it should be. And he's much more a student. I think of the studio versions of things. And so much of what we do comes from live versions of things where there is, there is, you know, a couple ticks up on, on a lot of the stuff. So Usually. There, yeah. There that's, some yeah. Back and forth. And there, there were some loose endings. It nothing was, nothing was a train wreck. Um, it didn't feel great. Um, when the tempos were a little bit slower and also, you know, there's something interesting. He was probably right mathematically on some of the tempos, but, um, I was watching us try to play at some of those tempos and, and watching people walk off the dance floor that they couldn't find the groove. Now, whether that's because we, there was that 
mystical thing that happens when the band is not on the same page about a tempo. So even yeah. though we're playing the right notes, the groove wasn't really locking, you know, because there was there was emotional connection to where the groove should be. And that's, you know, ultimately that's the litmus test. Like it is even, it's not that big a problem to play faster if people are digging it. Right. And then the right. band is, right. I mean, ultimately everybody's just on an adrenaline high, but um, you know, as I watched a couple of people walk up the dance floor. So anyway, day one, we did fine. Uh, you know, people really, the sound was just different than any other band that was there. Five piece horn section, you know, pulled out some songs that people hadn't heard before did a tribute to a uh, Bay area guy, originally New York guy, Eddie Money, that went over really well. Um, you know, there, there was a lot of good about the show, but it wasn't, we all knew that, you know, it felt not quite the best thing that we could do. Everybody goes their own way. And then Sunday, I'd say, and I send our drummer a note saying, um, good job, you know, be laser focused on the count offs and holding the content, the, the beats where me or Nick count something in. And also push a little bit more than you think, right? you know, air on the side of push as a opposed on the side of relax. Some things were just not grooving and the total pro didn't take it personally. Sure. Totally absorbed it. He crushed Sunday. It was like two different dudes. It was, it was spectacular. I mean, he was laying down some grooves. We've never heard anybody else lay down. I mean, he opened up, he had fun, you know, part of that first day was, you know, where do I fit into this? You know, how, how much do I push? Right. How much do I lay back? How yeah. much do I play? H how, you know, how much of me do I put in here? Exactly. Yep. He, for sure. He took, he took all the input, all constructive. He was total pro about his feedback. And it was, it was beyond great. It was spectacular on Sunday. Now, Sunday is a festival we've been doing for about 16 years in our town. It's our hometown festival, hometown crowd, great buzz, great love, everything like that. And I think that certainly fed into it, but he relaxed and he just played and he's a great player. And he like about three songs in, we knew today was going to be different than yesterday. And everybody relaxed and enjoyed the grooves, had a lot of fun, smiles all over the stage, you know, some great surprises, great moments. And so Sunday was cool. So that's the sub drummer story is, you know, understandably tentative. How does this work? No rehearsal. I'm walking in and, you know, just a little bit of a nudge because I know what he's capable of. And then he brought the whole package on Sunday and Sunday just knocked it out of the park. It was a delight. So yeah, that's you the, need that's the sub drummer story. Yeah, that, there, there's there's um there's a lesson in here because if you've got a drummer who's tentative for whatever reason, that's going to translate throughout your entire band, right? I mean, it, it, there's no way that that's not going to impact everything, and even impact the way that the way you're perceived by the crowd. Like if 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 your drummer doesn't have confidence in what he or she is doing, it's, it's, it, you're going to, you're going to notice that at, at different levels, depending on the band, your band is a pretty aggressive band. So if you've got somebody that's not pushing and not driving and for, again, for whatever reason, that's going to come through. But the trick is when you're bringing, especially, I feel like, especially a drummer in, but I would actually say the same thing. If you're bringing like a sub lead player in, mm -hmm. uh, you need to give them the freedom to be themselves. You know, if you've got somebody that's coming in to play leads, even if they're playing these great, technically perfect, you know, fantastic leads, if they're not owning the stage when they're playing that lead, that changes things. Right. And it changes not only how you're perceived by the crowd, but it's also how you, the rest of the band feels like, can we trust that when we hand the baton to that guy, He's going to take it and then, you know, give it back when it's when it when that's appropriate. And both of those things are important. And with the drummer, you really like I guess I've been in that scenario where for whatever reason, I don't feel like the band trusts me or, I, you know, there's some reason that my confidence is shaken and that's bad news. And you, you got it. I find for me, it's like it, as soon as I notice myself feeling that it's like, oh, wait, 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 wait. nope, I just have to forget all that whatever it is that's going on i gotta forget all that and just drive and if these guys keep complaining to me you know the mindset i'm gonna take in the middle of the gig is f those guys i'm doing it my way because i know that confidence is more important than 
anything, any little nuances. Obviously, if there's, you know, big issues, then you got to pay attention to those. But you got to be able to, like, hit that stage with confidence. So when you sub for me. Yeah. So you knew me and you knew how I play and you'd known enough about my band. I'd played with your band before. Oh, that's true. You have done a song here or a song there. I did a full set at your birthday, you know, five years prior or whatever it was. Was that was that this version of the band though? Was that pretty much the same guys? It was. It was, was Stephen. Club that's not there anymore. Right. Steve was there. Steve Nick and Nick there. were there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd sat in here and there with those guys too. So I wasn't walking in to a completely unknown scenario. That's and, right. And I felt like I had everyone's support. You know what I mean? Like there, certainly there were moments on stage where Nick would give me like a, you know, oh, d- do this differently or, you know, I want, you know, double time here or whatever it was or speed up like we do this faster. And I was like, fine. But there was he and I already knew each other. We had already played mm-hmm. together some. So there was a trust relationship both ways there. And the same with Steve. So that, like I, I, I never I mean, there were certainly moments where I I knew that I didn't know the song as well as everybody else. Right. But in terms of just my foundational confidence, I I had no trouble coming into that particular gig. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I think what you're saying is, is probably most useful is that there's, there's a happy medium between big ears and, and, and playing with confidence. Big ears doesn't mean playing tentatively. No, no. It means playing and listening at the same time. But right. But keep playing. Keep <laughs> don't, playing. But don't wait. Yeah. I remember there was this one gig I did. I wish I could remember the guy's name. I was living in Connecticut. Got the call the day before. It was a festival. And, and it was this guy was a piccolo bass player from I was in Connecticut. He was playing down in Connecticut. But uh, he was from, I think, Northampton, Mass or something. Uh, so if this rings a bell to anybody out there, I would love to remember what this guy's name was. But he was this piccolo bass player, this black guy, fantastic singer, fantastic, like virtuoso player. And he had, I think, a keyboard player in his band and a a bass player, like a straight bass player. So he was more taking that, you know, lead guitar role mm-hmm. uh, for the gig. And we had no rehearsal. Uh, we our our time together before the gig was in the men's room going through what the set was kind of going to be like and how they were going to walk me through it. I did not even know what songs we were going to play when we got on stage. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it wouldn't have mattered. I think we played, I remember playing a cover of Miles Davis's all blues, uh, but the rest of the stuff we played was his original tunes, but the bass player was great because and in fact, everybody was great, but the bass player especially said, you know, he's going to be his name. Joe, I want to say was the guy up front. Um, but the bass player is like, he's going to, you know, he needs to kind of be focused on the crowd, but, but he'll be paying attention. Don't worry. I'm like, yeah, yeah I get it. And he's like, but I will be your rock for this gig mm-hmm. and you stay with me. We are going to have a blast together. You know, like he was so positive. That's how Strom was. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But, but this guy, like I didn't, I knew Strom coming into this gig, right? This guy, like I had met him in the bathroom, literally. <laughs> and, and so he was like, we are going to be great. And he really like, he, you started guys, a few great relationships in your life in the bathroom. I'll tell you that. That is true. That's right. This particular <laughs> one right here with you and me. That's right. <laughs> uh, but you know, he knew he had never heard me play before. I was recommended by another drummer that they had called who knew that he, the, the gig was too big for him. He was like, Oh, you don't, you guys don't want me, but try Dave, see if he's available. And, uh, so, but they, you know, so they had a good recommendation, but they, they had never heard me play before. They didn't know if this was just going to be a disaster or what. Right. But this guy just communicated like joy and glee and confidence. He was like, we are going to go out and have a blast. It's going to be great. Just follow me. The grooves are straight ahead. I'll cue you. There are some breaks in the tunes, but I no problem, man. And this bass player was an active bass player. He moved all around the stage. But he made sure to catch my eye anytime there was like that gig went flawlessly. I guarantee I guarantee you the second gig that we played together, which never happened, would have been a train wreck because we would have all gone in like, oh, we got this. this. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But everybody knew that we all needed to really be like on point. But we were also delivering for a festival crowd. And the, the idea was other than, you know, my girlfriend and her friend. No one should know that this is a sub drummer, right? Like right. that this needs to be 
this fantastic, you know, band supporting this virtuoso piccolo bass player. And it, it did like people. Oh, God, it was so much fun. But um, but they really went out of their way to make me feel they knew the value of me feeling comfortable and confident and a little cocky even going out there. You need some level of that. Like, I trust myself to mm-hmm. do this and I'm going to play a fill here that's going to that I believe is going to work. And sometimes it doesn't, you know, whatever. But you got to have some of that yeah, cockiness is the wrong word. I think it's just confidence. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's tough, though. It, 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 you know, especially if you're getting all kinds of mixed messages from people on stage about like the nuances of it. It's like, OK, yep. You know, I was I I'm uh, trying to remember that gig, but um, and I don't I mean, there were there were, you know, corrections and coaching and all that. But it was never uh, you're doing it wrong kind of thing. Right. It was like, do it this other way with us. Yep. You know what I mean? Just a little. Yeah, no, I totally get it. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's actually what you're saying is one of the risks is that so when they walk in with no rehearsal, if three guys are, are all of a sudden pulling at different threads of this, you know, trying constructively to get the guy into the right place, that's worse. Because now the guy doesn't know where to look. That Now the guy doesn't know which, whose feedback to take. Right. And it's just, it's demoralizing. So that's it's the other demor- thing. It's demoralizing. Yeah. I remember when I joined. The only thing I said to him was, um, about seven songs, eight songs in, I kind of went back to him and I said, push the tempos a little bit faster than where you think they should be. That's that's the only you know yep. thing I gave him. He yep. nodded. And I think that helped a little bit. Sure. But what happened, uh, clearly what happened is, A, he learned a lot from the from the gig, went home and crammed the heck out of the stuff that now he knew he didn't know. Right. And um, a good example was he, uh, we played What I Like About You by The Romantics. Fun yeah. tune, right? Yeah. There's no dynamics to that song except for that one part, you know, where it's kind of a breakdown. But it is there's no dynamics to it. The guitars are playing essentially the same volume all the way through. The drums play the same volume all the way through. And he was used to coming down for the verses and coming up for uh-huh. coming up. Right. Yeah. Which, which is a very different thing. And I, and so um, I just whispered it to him, you know, plow through. And like I said, Sunday. I can almost not think of anything I would have changed about Sunday. There's a couple right. endings that just re- repetition, but he that that to me is what a pro is. Like he he took a bunch of mental notes, he took a bunch of physical notes, he went home and cleaned up the stuff that he knew he needed to clean up, took some input, and then just showed up on Sunday and played the way that he could. And it was a freaking dream. And it was fun too. You know, like that's the one thing about drummers, I guess any musician, but certainly specifically about drummers. When a drummer comes and sh- and sits in and shows a band a slightly different feel that works or a slightly different emphasis that works. It's really fun for a rhythm section to kind of oh, hear a different groove to find and, a different thing. Yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I, mean, I find that drummers uniquely can do that. Yeah. Like a, find, you know, a keyboard player, guitar player can play a different part and you go, Oh, that's kind of cool. But in terms of something that like shapes a song, drummers uniquely can create a vibe and a groove that can make it more fun or different fun. Not just more, just different fun yep. to play over. Well, it can make it interesting. I, from my perspective, I find that actually bass players and keyboard players are the, the two things that can change that for me. But that's me as the drummer, right? So it's like different, different perspective, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When I joined the responders, um, the first, I, you know, it took me like four, maybe, maybe even five gigs to finally get to the point where it was like, okay, these guys, cause they were all, you know, they had had the same drummer for like five years or something. And we rehearsed some before these gigs, but never enough, right? You got to yeah. just get on on stage and figure it out together. And they were like, ah, you know, these grooves, I get like, and all three of them were giving me different feedback. And then two of the guys just shut down and stopped talking to me. And I was like, oh, this is even worse. <laughs> like, you know, what's it going to take? And finally, I, you know, like the fourth or fifth gig, I'm like, this sucks. Like, we're all miserable here. And I realized that I had zero confidence walking into the gig. And that's when it was like, all right, you know what? I'm just going to play this set. I'm going to forget everything I've heard any one of these guys say to me about these songs because it's just a jumble in my head right now. I have no idea what they actually want because they're all saying different things. I'm sure they're all trying to say the same thing, but Mm -hmm. they're not communicating it. We haven't learned how to communicate yet. So I'm just going to go out and I'm going to play the gig I want to play. And we finished that set and all three of them turned around and they're like, what happened? That was awesome. I'm like, okay, so you just wanted a confident drummer. No problem. Got it. 
now I know what to do. Lesson learned. Let's go. And we had a you know great five year run together or whatever it was after mm-hmm. that. But yeah, it was, you know, when your confidence gets shaken, you got to get rid of that right away. And I've seen that with like lead players at times, especially if you bring somebody new in or whatever. And it's like, oh, dude, like I get that you're trying to find your place to fit in. But when it's time for you to rock, you got to rock. You got to rock. You yes, gotta rock. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what it was for me, too. It was like when it's time to rock, you got to rock. That's like job number one. Do not forget yep. that. It's OK if it's not perfect. You can tweak that stuff. But you got to rock, man. You got to rock. <laughs> I was thinking about the the types of audiences that we saw at these types of things. So, you know, festivals are, you know, it, they're not the music are a part of the agenda, but they're not the whole thing. You know, the art is there and the wine and the food and, you know, the strolling and the socializing. So it's not a concert where people are specifically coming. Some people will come and sit and watch music. Some people for a while, some people taking a whole set. Uh, there's a group in our area that is, we call them the festival crew. Yeah. They, you know, they get there at eight in the morning, they set their chairs out and they, you know, all day for two days will actually really passionately, passionately enjoy music and enjoy dancing. And and that's part of their socializing. And it's, it's actually a beautiful thing. Yeah. It's interesting to me. I was thinking about um, the types of crowds that I know locally, you know, there's, there's, there's a social crowd that, you know, goes out, um, and like they are, they represent quality, warm bodies that you can get to your gig. However, I think it's smart as a, as a band leader trying to create, um, a, a predictable audience yep. to understand that there's a difference between people who go out in your town or your area because it's a social thing to do. And, and really like hardcore music fans, there is much more there, there by getting the hearts and minds of the hardcore music fans. And this isn't to diss anybody. This, that's not what this is about. All I'm saying is understand the difference between a warm body. Another you know way that this has been said before, we know people, I know people, you know, people who represent warm bodies and we've had, we've done shows on this before and they'll come to a club or a restaurant and not, not patronize that club or restaurant. They're a warm body, but are they helping your cause with regards to keeping that gig at that venue? That's a harder thing, right? Uh, see, yes, you I, to say I brought in 12 people, but if, if the bartender at the end of the night goes, yeah, but I didn't make any money, that's that's going to that's going to you know pretty much determine your fate. Yes. Yeah, so, so I I see this as three different types of people, right? Because a lot of those people that are the nightlife crowd that may or may not care about the live music aspect, those people generally know and in it, how to behave in a bar, not not mm-hmm. like they behave poorly, but they know how to patronize the club. They know, uh, you know, like they're there to drink usually and have a good time and all of that. Um, it's often the music lovers that I find if there's going to there's two types of the music lovers, right, where it's there's the people that will come to see your band and are into the music, but aren't necessarily the best patrons for mm. a club. And and then there's there's the music lovers that get it and they're like, yeah, we're like, I'm going to see a good band, but also like we can go early and have dinner and a drink or two or, you know, or whatever the vibe of that particular you know venue is and and make the whole thing work. And obviously that last group, the people that are music lovers that also know how to patronize the venues. That's like, gold. That's gold. That's yeah. those are the types of people you want. Yeah. My point more about that social crowd is be careful because they're. They're fickle to invest in, right? I mean, th- their interest is in, you know, if there's a big crowd, you know, 20, 30 people, they have a social chain. What's going on this weekend? Where are you going? Um, it's much more a function of, oh, so-and-so is having their birthday party over at this restaurant or this nightclub. And then all 30 people kind of taken out of the pool of who you can get to to your gig, right? It, it's, it's yeah. you, are, you are a nice uh, part of their possibilities. Of their party. You're not an essential part of their, uh, uh, yeah. uh, their right? They're and just, just after understanding the, they're that. after the party, right? Yes. Yeah. They're after the party. And, you know, again, you use that for what you may. I, I know a guy who um, basically tries to figure out when, when anyone in the social group's birthday is and says, hey, we're celebrating so-and-so's birthday at my gig on this one. And every gig is a birthday gig, which is not – the way that I would go about it, but, but, it, but um, it is a it's, a, it's a tactic. It's yeah. a tactic. Yeah. And That's um, really, that, that is smart. I mean, being making your gigs events 
and events for the people that are coming, not necessarily just an event that's about you. I, I feel like there are there are bands out there that that grok this like Aerosmith is one of those bands. They know that what they are doing every night is throwing a huge party for all of those people. Right. Mm-hmm. Fish is another band like that. They know that they need that crowd in order for them to do what they've been doing for 30 years. And so like they create things that then become the crowds and yes. it's not the bands. Right. So well, isn't that, isn't that the best that that would be Jimmy Buffett, right? You go, J- you Jimmy know, Buffett's the, the same party way. you're going to have, right. Yes. Whether he's your cup yeah. of tea or not, if he is your cup of tea, you realize, and here's the downside of the, you were celebrating so-and-so's birthday. The more that you are focused on one person or one group, yes. you got to be careful whether you're going to you're going to alienate the rest of the people in the bar, right? Right. And so there's a, there's a certain art and science to getting the blend of that right, but better is to create your band, create your brand, create your vibe. That is a universal thing. Yep. That you know. You're, the, you're the, the music lovers are know, know what they're going to get and they're going to look forward to it. And if it is, again, we're talking about kind of like the club scene in most in most yeah. locales that, you know, you know that there's this group. There's there's always a one person is the head of the group, you know, who's the kind of party organizer. You know that, you know, that represents a lot of warm bodies. They're potentially great draws to help fill your gigs. Understand the the mechanics about working with a group like that and the sensitivities to that. The rest of the people in your town are, are probably also keenly aware when a big group walks in. And if your band all of a sudden just starts getting to them, that creates a, can, can create a little bit of an awkward vibe. So I think the better thing to do, and, I, and again, I was reflecting on this because this was, this was my gig on Sunday. Mm. Again, we've been playing it for a long time. It's, um, you know, when during the day when people said we got the house rockers at four o'clock and you hear people already, you know, at one in the afternoon screaming and clapping their hands and they're excited for it. You feel pretty good about what your gig is. I knew maybe 20 percent of the people in this pretty in this pretty decent sized crowd. Um, but more than that, knew me, knew us. Yep. And that was a really pleasant experience. And the the party that we threw, the show that we threw was inclusive and maybe that's the best word to sum up all this that's that's what you want that's what you're saying aerosmith does that's what i'm saying jimmy buffett does all everyone is welcome everyone is the same at our show everybody you know we are all in this together that is i think one of the most powerful things no matter what level of a band you are if you're a small bar band you know mid-sized club band you know touring band whatever it is if you can create that vibe that whatever you're whatever you music listener is buying into here is an inclusive experience. We're all, we're all in this together, whatever style of music that you have. I think that that's, that's the magic that grows audiences and and makes fans for life. Yeah. I would, this is, you know, this concept of intentional inclusivity, right. Is I think the key here, because if you can create, you can seed that, Right. Like you can you can do things that make it clear that this is part of your brand. Right. And it's stuff that happens off stage as much as on, you know, sending out a newsletter or something where you're not just saying here. It's all about me. Right. Here's our gigs. It's like, oh, you know, we'll we'll include some comments that people made from Facebook. We'll include some other things. Here's some cool stuff that is happening at our gigs. Not that we're doing, but that is happening at the gigs and Mm. like promoting that aspect of it really is the thing. I mean, I think back to the band go figure that we had in college and I mean, that band did phenomenally well. If it weren't for the, you know, the band completely imploding, I think it would have gone even further, but that's how things go. Uh, But we were really, we were really good at the whole communication thing. And, you know, the gigs were really just a part of that. And this was pre social media, all of that stuff. It was, you know, the mailing list, what the fans would communicate with each other. They would create their own parties and then invite us to play at them. Like these things were like the the band was bigger than us. Mm. And it was because we created that. And I I mean I say we I certainly helped facilitate it. I, I give a lot of the credit to Jeff Stebler, our, our singer at the time, who really was the one that sort of saw that vision. But, you know, he understood it. He he um, he understood what like bands like, you know, the Grateful Dead and Fish were doing in terms of mm. like we didn't do this. We were not that same kind of band. Uh, but the concept of 
this is your scene, not our scene. And mm-hmm. we want to we want to be a part of your scene. And so we will do the things that make it so that all of this happens. But it's your scene. And, you know, that really makes a difference. I, I you know, I, I think we yeah. uh, come from a, a professional environment where this was manifested to the greatest degree. So, you know, Guy Kawasaki, famous mm. Apple evangelist, his mantra was always create a cause, make your marketing a cause, make it yeah. something that people feel emotionally attached to. And of course, you know, how you and I grew up in the Apple world, it was very much communal, very much a cause that, that, that Apple was a well, better Apple platform the, than the competing, you know, platforms. They were the that underdog, was, you know, right? Yeah. That, that's a well, cause. And, well, they, and they played that, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they played so, it right up to the biggest company in the world. Yeah. Well, that's it. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, that that concept of harnessing a communal experience is a very powerful message almost in any walk of life. I mean, you know, in music, we want to do it healthily. You know, we want to do it in a really constructive way. But it is a powerful thing. And it can be as simple as putting on a parrot head cap or it could be, you know, as as intense as, you know, I'm quitting my job and I'm going on the road with these guys. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm going to follow them around for six months, <laughs> wherever it might be. If you've created a cause that you're willing to put a guy you know, who's an executive at a company into a parrot head cap on the weekend, you win. You, you get all the chips because you've created a cause. You've created a, 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 a non-exclusive uh, club. All, everyone's welcome. And um, that's just a very powerful thing in harnessing an audience. And and it again, is. I'm just relating that because that's what it felt like to me. It might be 16 years of playing the festival over and over again and the goodwill that you get from that. We've done our work. I mean, we've, we've created a fun show that people seem to enjoy and we are f- quite diligent about delivering it with a certain level of quality and having a tone and picking songs, you know, that are interesting. We, we should do a whole show we Nick and I, I'm just going to seed it with you. I don't want you to think about it. Nick and I said, you know, the, the most successful songs we do are happy songs. You know, the ones that kind of are uplifting, you yep. know, you do yeah. kind of, a, you know, like we might dive into something that's kind of like a, you know, nasty or intense groove or like, we, you know, we do, we do, um, um, uh, my mind's blank. What's the, what's the big Metallica hit? Oh, enter Sandman. Yeah. So yeah. that's we a do song that. you can play happy though. Like it works. Well, but it, it, what it is, is if you've made people happy enough, headbanging is a novel thing among our crowd. Like yes. again, if you're a metal band, you're all in and you're, you're taking a different mood for that type of thing. And again, there's a, there's a path to inclusiveness and community. Metal does that really well. I mean, metal exists today because of that, right? Absolutely. I mean, metal, Especially metal Metallica. Those yeah, guys, exactly. those guys created a community and, and like, as good as any other that we've mentioned here. Most people don't realize it because most people aren't in, you know, I mean, if, if you're not into that music, then people you don't live and die for that. Band. You don't know. But yeah, like that band, they have tapers. They have like the whole thing happens there. It's like going to a dead show, except completely not, you know, but, but very much that, that community vibe. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So the last thought on that is, of course, today is one of the great days in history because today is Bruce Springsteen's birthday, 70 years old today. And Bruce has one of the many great lines that Bruce has shared is that he has viewed his career as an ongoing conversation with his audience. Sometimes he wants to talk about serious things. Sometimes he wants to talk about frivolous things. Sometimes he wants to talk about art. Sometimes he wants to talk about girls and cars. But it's an ongoing conversation that he has always had a very long view that that, you know, his his audience is an organic entity that he wants to nurture and feed and talk to. And that's that's his method of inclusiveness is that it, it, you, I still this year, after all these years of listening to him, I still feel like he's having a conversation with me individually. That's his that's his superpower, probably. Right. No, it is. It. I will say this, though, the experience that I had at uh, seeing Springsteen was the most exclusive I've ever felt at a show. It was like, there was this group for sure. I would feel that at a Metallica show. I would probably feel that. I've been to a a Metallica show as a not Metallica fan. And everybody was like open arms. It was no, the Springsteen vibe that, that I experienced walking in as a non Springsteen fan. Well, you've never walked in as a non Springsteen fan. It was like, people were flabbergasted. Like, what do you mean? This is your first Springsteen show. How come you haven't (laughs) seen others? And it's like, F you like what, what, you know, it really was off putting and it wasn't just 
one person. It was like everybody oh around God. us. Yeah, it was it was very off putting. I, I did not like it. And then it was and that puts me in the mindset of what's the matter with these people? And then you get Bruce on stage <laughs> acting like a preacher and all these people acting like his disciples. And it's like there's something wrong with y'all. Uh, but that's cool. You know, like, look, they just put on a three hour show. Like, I'll give them credit for that. But the vibe was was not comfortable at all. And I've, I've heard I, you know, this you from saying other it, people. I can understand. I can understand it. Yeah. It seems I have to get myself in that place where I yeah. can hear that that type of thing. I get it, and everything you said makes total sense. However, his method of inclusiveness with his audience has worked clearly worked. And again, yes. I think that 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 mantra that that mindset of no, I what think he Bruce thinks his is art inclusive. Is. It's just that his audience <laughs> is not. No, well, really, like you it, can't have you can't have one without the other, though. I, it doesn't I, work. Like I, I agree. You know, yeah, I, I, it did not work for me. And I've didn't mentioned, work, it didn't work for you. I've mentioned this to other people and people that aren't like diehard Springsteen fans have said I felt exactly the same way. How interesting. I know. It's weird. Right, but because we're friends, you do wish Bruce a happy birthday today. I right? would actually love to go with you to see Bruce someday. So yeah. like I, I'm I'm open to this idea. It was just a really we may weird have a chance scenario. next summer. There you go. So maybe. Who knows? Fingers crossed. Hey, All so right, on this intentional inclusivity thing. If you've done this with your band, either successfully or unsuccessfully, we would love to hear definitely what strategies, what has worked for you, what hasn't worked for you. Like, I think this is something that we really could we can all benefit from here. And so, yeah, send us your notes. Uh, you know, you can send them to us on Facebook, of course, at GigGabPodcast.com dot com slash Facebook will get you there, but also just feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We'd love to hear, even if you think it's a silly idea or you think you just got lucky with it, that's fine. You tell us because luck is always a part of it, but you know, preparation also factors into luck. So, <laughs> uh, you, you know, I think there, there's always more to luck than, uh, than, than one, one might think. So yeah, this is good. This is good. All right, that's all I got for today. How about you? I got good. three outdoor gigs this weekend, which is weird. At weather's you know, still good. It's like eighty-five degrees today, so <laughs> yeah. So, I, and I think the weather is supposed to be good through the weekend. I've got a Thursday night uh, at Monkey Fist at, at the Gaslight in Portsmouth, and then a, a Saturday night at the Dairy Field, actually with a different guitar player. And then Sunday is an outdoor fling gig at this afternoon. They call it Porch Fest, but it's really just a big outdoor festival in the center of uh, Rochester. I think if you, I've heard this term Porch Fest. I think a lot of towns are picking up on that. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, it's Kinda a cool. cool. It's, it seems like it, we did it last year and it was a cool thing. They they have several different areas of town and bands are all playing like from, you know, the bands that are playing from noon to one thirty are in this area. The bands that are from, you know, one thirty to three are in the second area. And then we're I think we're at three thirty to uh, I don't know what time we are, but whatever we're with. I think we start at three. We play three to four thirty and that's it. You know, that's in this third area. And they do. They kind of, you know, the people sort of move around in their shops and different stuff happening. So should be cool. I think. Yeah. I'll look forward to the stories. I'm sure there will be stories. Hopefully there's no rain. And then I will have stories to tell other than it got canceled. It rained. Yeah, <laughs> yes. that's right. I sat at home. It was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Happy birthday, Bruce. Uh, happy birthday indeed, Bruce. Yeah. Born one day. Before, uh, well, not born one day, but he celebrates his birthday one day before one of your two favorite Gig Gab hosts. So there you go. We'll see you next week. <laughs>